when a serious crime is committed and the police need all the help they can get, there's one group of people they turn to time after time, the expert witnesses. An expert witness is critical because they're going to have that deep level knowledge to really determine if something stands out that doesn't look quite right. An extraordinary army of men and women with the expertise to reveal the hidden clues criminals have left behind. My brain just sort of exploded with different ideas. Even a single-celled organism can solve a crime. They search harder and look deeper using the very latest techniques. They're constantly evolving, constantly improving. It's soon going to become impossible to get away with murder. This is the inside story of how science helped solve some of the UK's most complex cases. That was one of my eureka moments in all my 30 years of forensic examination. The chances of finding something were really incredibly slim. That tiny possibility had to be explored. I've seen people talk about justice being done, but no matter what kind of punishment he faced, it would never be enough. This is the story of the expert witness. In this episode, we discover how analysis of soil samples helped solve a brutal murder case. It was a case of allowing the evidence to shine through and speak for itself. And we reveal how when police needed to find a suspect fast, forensic cell phone analysis was critical. Sometimes turning a phone off or leaving a phone unattended can indicate a level of potential guilt. To the naked eye, it may just appear as if it's soil. But within it, there are so many stories that it can tell. April 2019, South Ayrshire. When 39-year-old Emma Folds failed to turn up for work, her friends and family were immediately concerned and contacted the police. Former Detective Chief Superintendent Paul Dockley followed the case at the time. Emma Foles was a 39-year-old woman who was a youth worker. She loved her dog and she was a good daughter. She kept in touch with her parents. Her parents were concerned that they hadn't received a call from her and she's reported missing to the police and inquiries commence. BBC Scotland's Katrina Renton reported on the story. It was a huge media story at the time when Emma had gone missing because it was so out of character. Police went to Emma's flat and they burst down the door. They found no trace of Emma inside, but what they did find was her little dog, her West Highland Terrier, Maverick. Now, this is really significant because Emma loved that little dog more than anything in the world, and there is no way Emma would have left Maverick alone for any length of time. Police launched a missing persons inquiry, but a week later, there was still no sign of Emma. Emma Fold's family reported her missing on Tuesday the 30th of April 2019. They last heard from Emma on the Sunday. Police discovered that on the night she disappeared, Emma drove from her home in Kilmarnock to visit a friend in Moncton. CCTV showed her car back outside her house the next morning, but with a man at the wheel, carefully wiping down the dashboard. That wasn't Emma that was driving that car. Her car was left in a way that she would never have parked it. Some had described it as being effectively abandoned in the street. So what was going on here? Well, that was the question that police had to get to the bottom of. The CCTV footage was not good enough quality to allow a definitive identification of the man. Detectives now began to consider the friend Emma had dinner with, 42-year-old Ross Willocks. The pair had known each other for 18 years since they were prison officers at Kilmarnock Prison, and they'd become good friends. 
but there was some evidence that started to place Willocks in a suspicious light. As a result of CCTV, we've got Wilkes buying rubber gloves, disinfectant, that would indicate that he's clearing up after a mess is made. So what is this man doing? Although Wilkes is a friend, he's also a suspect. Police began searching the home of Ross Willocks. Meanwhile, investigators attempted to establish Willocks's movements around the time of Emma's disappearance. We are very fortunate in this day and age to have the ability to track mobile phones to our best advantage. The intelligence was that in the days that followed, Wilkes had been on two occasions in Galloway Forest, in a remote part of Scotland. The Galloway Forest is an enormous area of land. It's, I think it's about 300 square miles. So you can imagine that they needed clues, clues that would lead them to specific parts of the forest to be able to search properly. The intelligence was that Wilkes had worked on a wind farm in Galloway Forest. Now, people do return to places that they're confident they can go to and not be seen in cases like this. He would have known exactly where he could have disposed of the body with a very slim chance of a walker or a hiker finding it. But detectives faced a problem. Mobile phone data proved Willocks entered this wilderness. But with so few mobile phone masks in the region, the detectives could not pinpoint exactly where he went. It is two and a half weeks since Emma Folds was last seen. This remote countryside is now the focus of the search for her body. Police are using a helicopter to map out the vast area between South Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway. The search area in this case was massive. You have to break it down into boxes and you search each box one by one. The police officer and the police dog walked 200 miles in the search for Emma's body. The scale of the search seemed overwhelming. So, detectives turned to evidence from Ross Willocks's house. In particular, a pair of mud soil boots. Could these hold clues to Willocks's movements and Emma's precise location? To find out, police called in soil expert Professor Lorna Dawson. They were a pair of light-coloured Timberland boots and there was a moderate amount of both soil and vegetation adhering to both the uppers and the soles of both left and right boots. If Lorna and her team could work out where this soil and vegetation had come from, they could help to identify where Ross Willocks had been in Galloway Forest Park. This is a similar type of boot to the boot that we received in the Emma Falls case. It also had staining and deposits around this junction of the stitching between the uppers and the sole, which because of the stitching, the seeds of the grasses and the heathers and the mosses sticks there and retains to that material and that we can then recover it in the laboratory safe environment. Lorna hoped she could identify the precise origins of the soil sample using a scientific method known as chromatography. This chromatography method allows us to discriminate between soils half a metre away from each other. It's very precise and can take us to a specific location, narrowing down to a half metre square area of soil. The soil that was adhering to both Timberland boots was very clearly a fibrous peat. And it was a wet, boggy peat because it was adhering in a particular stained way on the items of footwear. We could also tell that um, there was a range of mosses adhering. There was also fragments of heather and little fragments of grass. Now, all that together 
suggested that that had been a boggy environment in a wet heathland area. Lorna compared these findings with information on the vast Scottish soil database. She identified just one small area where the combination of soil and plant particles could have come from. A riverbank in Galloway Forest Park. Within 24 hours, police made a tragic discovery. This is at the actual location where Emma Falls was found by the search team. She was lying just visible, lying in a drainage ditch. You can see the same combination of the mosses and the large tufts and mounds where the mosses have formed over time. But it still will always be a very sad place. Lorna's sole evidence proved with 95% certainty that Willocks was at the scene right beside Emma's body. It's a great piece of connectivity in relation to trace evidence from the suspect to the scene of the crime. Now detectives asked Lorna if she could go even further. This is the village of Bar Hill in South Ayrshire. The A714 runs through it, and it's the 30-mile stretch between Girvan and Newton Stewart that police are particularly interested in. They are appealing for more information about two cars, a black Mercedes and a black Jaguar, seen on this road in the days following Emma's disappearance. Both cars were owned by Ross Willocks. Lorna now examined them for samples of soil. She hoped to reveal whether one of them had been driven to the site where Emma was found. One sample stood out. The soil sample on the very rear of the Mercedes was similar to a soil sample that we took at the very edge of the trackway into the site where Emma was found. It was 92% similar in terms of its organic characteristics with that that we found on the vehicle. Detectives now used Lorna's wealth of evidence to piece together what happened the night Emma was killed. The theory was that Emma had died at Ross Willocks's home and that the next day Ross Willocks was caught on CCTV buying bleach and Ross Willocks cleaned his patio with the bleach. His car was caught on CCTV driving towards the Galloway Forest the next day to dispose of her body. That was the theory that the police had, but they had to try and convince the jury of that. In April 2021, the trial of Ross Willocks for the murder of Emma Folds began at the High Court in Glasgow. Lorna's soil evidence was a key part of the prosecution's case. I was in the court for over a day, and it was a case of allowing the evidence to shine through and speak for itself. On the 25th of May, 2021, Ross Willocks was convicted of the murder of Emma Folds and sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. The police service are well serviced by some excellent support staff like the soil specialist that can so help investigations uh, get the right results at the end of the day. It's really rewarding in that the physical evidence, the soil and the vegetation helped return Emma to her family. And it also helped bring justice for her family as well. Everybody's got a mobile phone, including suspects in serious cases. The art of cell site analysis is working out the general location of that phone at the significant times in that investigation. Belfast, 2016. A car bomb explodes under a van in the east part of the city. 52-year-old Adrian Ismay is rushed to hospital with life-threatening injuries. 
Shortly after 7 a.m., Mr. Ismay left the drive of his house, turned left, and the bomb exploded. The explosive was RDX, sometimes found in Semtex. Mr. Ismay suffered several shrapnel wounds. Belfast Crown Court reporter Ashley MacDonald covered the case extensively at the time. After the bomb exploded, Adrian Esmey was, was very quickly rushed to hospital where he was treated for very severe leg wounds. The wounds didn't prove to be fatal, but he developed thrombosis and as a result of that had a heart attack, which proved to be fatal. Adrian Ismay was a prison officer who lived in East Belfast. He was uh, seen very much as a community worker. He involved himself in St John's Ambulance. He was involved in community rescue missions and generally a larger-than-life character who was very well respected and very well loved. His murder stunned the local community. Adrian Ismay's death has come as a shock to his family, friends and former colleagues. His family unnecessarily traumatised as a result of people using violence in this way, which is just entirely inexcusable. Almost 20 years after the Good Friday Agreement, the attack harked back to a dark time in Belfast history. During the Troubles, prison officers unfortunately were targeted by paramilitaries because of their jobs. They were guarding prisoners, political prisoners, so prison officers in Northern Ireland were seen by some sections as legitimate targets. Mr Ismay's murder was so shocking because these kind of murders hadn't been committed for a very long time. So the police reacted very quickly. The police service in Northern Ireland began their investigation by studying CCTV footage of the area around Adrian Ismay's house the night before the murder. A red Citroen car caught the detective's attention. They were able to trace the CCTV back and they were able to ascertain that it had been driven from West Belfast. Now in Northern Ireland, West Belfast is predominantly nationalist and East Belfast is predominantly unionist. So this in itself, in the middle of the night, would have raised questions. Police seized the car and carried out a forensic examination. The results proved interesting. There was residue from, from the same type of explosives that was used on the bomb, which was placed under Adrian Esme's car. Semtex residue, which proved that this was the car that transported the bomb. Detectives questioned the owner of the vehicle, but he was at work that evening, a fact which could be confirmed by colleagues. Very quickly, the police became more interested in the brother of the owner, Christopher Robinson. Robinson and Adrian Ismay were acquainted. They had actually volunteered together in St John's Ambulance and these two men knew each other, not, not very well, but they knew each other because they were both volunteers and there had been no ill word or bad blood between them in the time that they volunteered together. But detectives discovered that Christopher Robinson was very critical of the Northern Irish Prison Service on social media. Further investigation into Robinson caused them to become increasingly suspicious. There's no question that he was very, very interested in the welfare of Republican prisoners. And in the months leading to the bomb attack, Christopher Robinson had repeatedly searched Adrian Ismay's profile on, on, on St. John, John's Ambulance website and other community groups that he was involved in. Police continued their investigation by searching key areas linked to the case and discovered, of all things, a poppy appeal sticker in a rubbish bin. They carried out a forensic examination and discovered that the poppy sticker had Christopher Robinson's DNA on it. In Northern Ireland, the poppy is seen by many as a political symbol of Britishness, so for Robinson to be linked to one was unusual. Detectives began to develop a theory that the poppy sticker was used on the Citroen car that transported the bomb and that it was, in fact, Christopher who was driving. Christopher Robinson was from a nationalist background. He was very critical of the police. He would not have been one to have a British Legion poppy sticker in any vehicle. However, police believe that this poppy sticker was placed on the Citroen car 
Police believe that this was to make it less conspicuous in a unionist area. Robinson, however, had an alibi. When questioned by the police, he claimed he was at home and had not left the house all evening. Police suspected that he had planted the bomb underneath Adrian Ismay's car. But so far, they only had circumstantial evidence. They needed hard proof and hoped his mobile phone could provide it. So they turned to an expert witness, cell site analysis specialist, Paul Hope. Everybody's got a mobile phone, and that includes suspects uh, in serious cases. Now, my job is to try and assess the general location of that phone around the time of the offences or around the time of significant events, which can show where, presumably, the user of that phone, who may be the suspect, was located. A cell is the device that transmits and receives mobile phone signals. If you look to the top of the mast, there are some white plates, and those plates are cells. And each of those cells has a specific cell ID number, which identifies that cell from all the others in the UK. The cell ID number is recorded every time a mobile phone connects to it, creating a data record that Paul can take home. As we're driving along, the equipment in the back is taking a measurement to work out the best serving cell, and that is what your mobile phone would do. And it's also recording that best serving cell and also recording the exact location where that measurement has been taken. And it will give us the best serving cells that the equipment saw on different frequencies and different networks along the route of this road. By analysing this cell site's data record, Paul can determine the location of a mobile phone at any given time. Police hoped he could use the data record for Christopher Robinson's phone to reveal his movements the night the bomb was planted. So I looked at the period and it showed me a route that went from Mr Robinson's home address area and went north. It then continued from the docks area of Belfast and went to an area which included a hostel. Paul's examination broke Robinson's alibi and proved he had left the house. But it didn't show he went to Adrian Ismay's home to plant a bomb. Instead, it showed he went to a hostel four miles away. Once he was at the hostel, his phone it acted, I thought, quite strangely, because the peripheral activity that had been taking place on the phone seemed to stop. There were no calls, there were no text messages. There are then numerous repeated device data records which would not require any user interaction and all using the same cell ID, which indicates not only has the phone not left that specific area of coverage, but also hasn't recorded any activity that would require Mr. Robinson's presence. It seemed that once at the hostel, Robinson did not use his phone nor did the phone leave the building. To Paul, that was suspicious. In my job, sometimes the inactivity of a phone can prove just as much as the activity. Sometimes turning a phone off or leaving a phone unattended can indicate a level of potential guilt. Detectives looked into the hostel and discovered Christopher Robinson's brother worked there. The man who owned the suspicious red Citroen Christopher Robinson's brother was questioned about his car, and crucially, the time period involved in the police investigation. Robinson's brother refused to cooperate with inquiries, but soon, a witness came forward. It emerged through a colleague in the hostel that Christopher Robinson's brother had turned the CCTV off in the hostel and told his colleagues, if my brother Christy calls, you know nothing. Detectives believed that Robinson had swapped cars from his own grey Skoda to his brother's red Citroen once at the hostel. Paul Hope's cell phone analysis coupled with testimony and DNA evidence was enough to solve the case.
Christopher Robinson was arrested for the murder of Adrian Ismay and in October 2018 stood trial at Belfast Crown Court. The trial was conducted without a jury in order to prevent the threat of intimidation. In Northern Ireland, we have what's known as diplock trials, which means that there are no juries. These are reserved for cases where there is a paramilitary link. I gave evidence uh, at trial. It was in front of a judge. There was no jury, it was just a judge. I've never had that before. And we went through the evidence line by line. And each line was uh, commented on and the judge identified the location on every line of data. The judge was meticulous in exactly what each line of data was telling us. And as a result, Mr. Robinson was found guilty. On the 6th of March, 2020, Christopher Robinson was sentenced to life to serve a minimum of 22 years behind bars. The judge concluded that Christopher Robinson was aware that Adrian Esme was going to be targeted, that he drove the car that transported the bomber and the bomb from the west of the city to the east. And the work of the expert witnesses in this case were vital. Mr Robinson's alibi was that he'd been at his home address throughout that evening. And my evidence clearly showed that not only his, his vehicle, but the phone had travelled to Belfast area and then gone to the hostel where it remained for a significant period before re returning home early hours of the following morning. After the trial, Adrian Ismay's family thanks the expert witnesses involved for their dedication and hard work in bringing about justice for their loved one. Thankfully, these attacks are very, very rare. It's shocking, it's shocking that, we're, that this is a crime that's happening in modern society. This case should act as a great deterrent for those who are even considering getting involved in paramilitary or terrorist activity of any kind. You might have got away with it in the 70s and 80s, but with modern technology today and with expert witnesses and everything they have at their fingertips, this really should act as a deterrent. You will get caught. <laughs>